today with Kathy Barati to talk about her solo exhibition, Neo Sublime, which is currently on display here at the Senti Bean through April 27th. Barati is a contemporary artist developing the concept of a new sublime. She applies the classical philosophical notions of the sublime to overwhelming and incomprehensible current events and creates aesthetically pleasing and thought-provoking paintings that provide validation, support, and comfort to people. She's currently an MFA student at Georgia Southern University and received her BFA in painting from Savannah College of Art Design. Neo Sublime seeks to answer the question, does the sublime exist in the contemporary world and can it be rendered in contemporary art? The search for the answer begins with the philosophical concepts of the sublime as described by Immanuel Kant and Edmund Burke. It is informed by art from the Romantic period to the present. The pieces presented in this exhibition concentrate on the theme of the invisible on the theme of the invisible, insidious, and ubiquitous qualities of climate change. Sea level rise, globalization, and air pollution, and weather pattern changes are strongly depicted in deceptively calm landscape scenes. Small human figures or products of industrialization are signifiers that there is rarely a landscape that doesn't have evidence of human behavior. So, Kathy, thank you so much for being here with us today. I'm looking forward to talking with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a great opportunity to talk about myself and my art, you know. It was the favorite thing artists like to do. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's a, and it's a great exhibition. Um, do you want to maybe start by talking about the origins of the series and like your, your concept of the Neo Sublime? Mm -hmm. um, I was, um, most of my life until recently, I was involved in science and particular biology. So I had that, but always loved art. And so when I retired, um, art was like, wow, I'm moving to Savannah. And Scat. So I got into art, and so so then um, I had an opportunity to curate an exhibition um, at, at Scat, and it, I had came up with a name, and, and I had to think about something pertinent to what's happening now. And so global warming or climate change was it, and I heard the name Anthropocene, and uh, that struck with me. And so then the, the whole exhibit turned out to be very huge, was on the Anthropocene. Anthropocene is really a reference to humans changing the earth in dramatic ways and, uh, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, which brings me to the Neo Sublime. Um, in at Georgia Southern, in uh, art theory class, we talked about the sublime, and I mentioned that one of my paintings is sub subliminal. It looks like the sublime, and the professor said, well, what does that mean, sublime? And I just said, oh, it's serene and calm. And then he said, have you ever heard of Emmanuel Kant or um, Edmund Burke and their ideas of the sublime? And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> so I learned really quickly. And uh, then because I was embarrassed, because I don't have a background in philosophy and whatnot, I started to learn more about it. And I was fascinated. You know, Emmanuel Kant, he talks about the sublime as the greatest of the great. Unbelievable. You can't wrap your head around it. And then Edmund Burke talks about the same idea, but then puts in the um, the emotions that are the, that are the most powerful: fear, terror. And so he combines that. The most powerful emotion is part of, of the sublime. So then I thought about: uh, Is there a sublime? And the, and the teacher actually said there is. Sublime has fallen by the wayside in the art world right now. And it really is passe. And I said, wait a minute, I think there may be some ideas of the sublime in contemporary, in the contemporary world and in contemporary art. So um, I looked to the news, contemporary news, which leads to contemporary art, and I decided on three things that I would say are beyond comprehension. You cannot get, wrap your head around it, it's just too much to absorb. And uh, those three things would be global warming or climate change, the pandemic, no doubt, the COVID pandemic, and political chaos, which I added as the past year has gone by. Um, Neo means Greek, means new, and then sublime. So I thought I invented that phrase, and I Googled it. I couldn't find it, and then I did find somebody, but I just said I coined that the new sublime, the sublime of now, um, that type of thing. 
So those are the three main uh, parts of the whole story that comes from. See, that's such a rich concept of the, the evolution of it that you've outlined, so it's with the beginnings in science, and that sort of, that spirit of investigation seems to have just continued as we got into the philosophy of it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, when I think of the sublime, I always think of this, this combination, like you're saying, of the beautiful and the, and the terror. Mm -hmm. That's the overwhelming, Good and side, bad side of the overwhelming. So maybe uh, get into like how that's manifested in some of your imagery. Mm -hmm. Well, um, Edmund Burke talks about and he gives an example of being in a safe place and looking at a t terrible event. You know, you're in a safe place, like and uh, a thunderstorm is happening over there, and you're like blown away by it. But you, at the same time, you receive pleasure because it's not going to hurt you. You're afraid but you receive pleasure because of the overwhelming aspect of it. And so um, this piece behind me is uh, fragments of all different types of sublimes. And um, this one in the corner, uh, it is a painting, a seascape from Tybee Beach, taken uh, sunrise at Tybee Beach. And of course there's a cargo ship, right, in the view of the sun. So that brings me to the idea of globalization. How does globalization affect climate change or um, global warming, you know, industrialization, modernity, you know, how the Industrial Revolution started the beginning of the end, that kind of thing. So um, then uh, this piece here with the three youths standing on a rock, that's like on a seashore place up in Maine, uh, uh, Penquid Point, and there's a lighthouse nearby. But that was a by chance photograph I took of those three individuals. Kind of, here's global warming coming in, yet we're still playing, you know, they're still kind of in their own miniature click and just having a good time. And yet, uh, other things are happening behind them. What's, you know, the climate is changing, the sun rise and set are so much more red and brilliant because of the particular matter, you know, air pollution in the world. So it touches on that. Um, and so on and so forth. You know, uh, each one, uh, this speaks a little bit about sea level rise, which is certainly a problem in Savannah. Uh, you know, uh, the scientists at Skidaway have are blown away by the, the height of the water that is coming up and then just in the past five, ten years. And so anyways, this, this it was inspired by another uh, classmate who discovered an artist and his name is uh, leaving me right now. But this artist played with foregrounds and backgrounds, you know, and kind of mixed it up, you know, so that here's a, fore, here's a foreground and then there's a background, but then there's a background, but in the middle, you know, the middle ground. And so then there's just playing like pieces, almost uh, fractures of scenes put together you know, as a composite. So, and he called them backdrops rather than foregrounds and backgrounds. He called them backdrops because they were so movable. So that was an experiment, I'm not experiment. Yeah, I, I definitely see it in this one that you're pulling together, like you're using traditions of painting and landscape painting and you're saying like perspective and scale, foreground, background, but you're you're manipulating it in a way where there's you're introducing the tension of that fact that these things these scenes are so beautiful, but then there's something sinister kind of you know, looking along and after that you start to pick up these little hints. That's a perfect word, sinister, because I do use sinister lines. There's a, this line, the diagonal that comes down from that corner to this is called a sinister line, whereas this one that comes up is a broke. And so if you look at composition, this starting here to that is a calming, but if you start from here to there, you introduce the viewer into the, the frame of the painting, and it's unstable, and it's sinister, and that's why it's called a sinister line. It denotes uh, an ominous comment. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There are these subtleties that are just built into it, right. sort of just innately feel from looking at it. Yeah. Um, so 
would you like to share maybe as well some of the processes with these other pieces that are more like, for, for example, this more abstract piece? Um, how maybe was informed by other pieces of the direction? Um, this piece was um, taken from a photograph, which is part of my process. Um, I started out with unplanned air painting, painting in the outdoors. And then, um, for a lot of reasons, the weather and whatnot, and then I went to large format, so it was a little bit unwieldy, although I still would like to try that. So I take photographs of something that just strikes me, that is the wow, the wow factor in uh, a painting. You, know, you have realistic painting, photorealistic, and then you have wow factor, and then you have abstract, or more idea generating. So, so it's so. This is more of the third idea generated, and this fits in with the Earth shaking humans off enough already, you know, and that's reflected in uh, increase in earthquakes, global events, tornadoes today, you know, in Savannah, and just just recently. Uh, Snowstorms in Texas and all this. So one person said, and I don't know who it was, but they said, it's like Mother Earth is tired of all these, this fungal-like growth of humans, and she's trying to shake us off. So it was, it's that kind of idea. So I start out with a very traditional um, landscape, of forest, and then as, it, as I paint, things become more disrupted. Um, in the middle, on that uh, horizontal line in the middle, again, horizontal line is a peaceful thing, a uh, peaceful line. In the middle, it's actually a bridge, and there's a car. And I can show a few, but this is kind of a signifier or a secret within. So it's a, kind of something I like to do is put a little secret in some of the paintings. So there is a little car on the bridge um, to say, well, Anywhere you go in nature, in the world, actually, you're going to see evidence of humans. There's always a little footprint of the human. We just can't get away from it. Always the reminder that the humans are killing humans by destroying them. Yeah, that's yeah. something I've been hearing a lot of recently, too, that we think we have this perception that there's still so much great space left out there. But if you really look at the maps and everything that we've touched and gotten our hands on already, there's not much left, and it's happening, and it's like falling right out from the um, And another you know, point that in the sublime that was used in like 19th century painting you're referencing is the smallness of ourselves in relation to Earth as a whole. And you've got that, you've got that in these pieces, you've got that abstraction too, mm -hmm. you're saying with the car. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where some of the, the interesting tension is because. You're not hitting people over the head with this. Yeah. Like they have to look for a while to get that. Yeah, it's subtle. And even I had a thought, I hadn't thought of this before, is icebergs, you know, the, or the glaciers, just fracturing the deconstruction, if you want to use that art term, the deconstruction of the earth. So the earth will be here, but we won't be. It's going. So earth will keep going, humans not so much. Which is kind of ironic. <laughs> the one behind you is kind of interesting. Yeah. Uh, it's more, um, it's a window and, uh, to, to your other side. And uh, so I've been playing with outside in and inside out. And this was inspired by the, uh, a year ago when we went into quarantine. And this is what it felt like. Being inside dark and looking out. And this is very traditional type painting. Um, Andrew Wyatt did a whole series on windows, a lot of them, a lot. And so did more recently uh, this woman, Lois Dodd, who is now, I think she's 95, still living, and she did a window series as well. So, and then, you, then it brings in the grid, the concept of grid, and um, some, some artists have talked about that in the organized, regimented, and then to go with the grid and let it direct your art, or go against the grid and change
challenge it. And, and the ones are. Yeah, it's like you're, you're mediating nature in two different ways. So you've got the grid, and then you've also got this like, transparent boundary of the window in between. So just trying to like compartmentalize, you know, the chaos. And stuff like that. So I was kind of a um, kind of a, a little bit of a surprise or a happy accident. I was uh, wanting to do uh, more realistic, and then as I painted uh, along the windowsill on the top, I did a little bit of Andrew White, you know, sort of. Uh, and then it gets to be a, a Trump loyal, whereas, um, you know, fools the eye, that type of art, way back when. So, it's kind of a fun piece. Interestingly, though, you would think, you know, I like to do art for everybody. You know, I like to do beautiful art so that it's pleasing, but I also like to have art that has a hook. You know, you go by and go, oh, what's that? And then you go in and you find something. Oh, and then you go out and you find something more. It changes. So there's perceptual shifts. I really love um, perceptual shifts um, within the art. And this one, that, um, I think we were looking at a second ago. This one, uh, I was playing with more materiality. Like, how do I get those perceptual shifts? And you, most of these, the ones we talked about, are, well, this is acrylic. And so I played with some gel. And so... Yeah, the water is wet, but then you make it wet with the actual material. And then it, it throws back to uh, before the Revo uh, Industrial Revolution, uh, people were afraid of nature. And so the, the darkness of the wood is almost like a fear. So I don't have a signifier of humans in there, but I do because it's human fear. So it's like an invisible signifier. Yeah, I like that point about like the perceptual shifts and, and the different angles from which you can approach it. So you have, you know, if someone's just interested in the beauty of the in that way, and if they're interested in the, the conceptual depth of it, they can engage with it in that way. Yeah. In the paintings, uh, all paintings and all art, which I think is that makes it fascinating to people who like art, is that it's a puzzle. When you do art, it's a puzzle. Like, you start out with one idea and then then you go on an adventure, then it goes to something else, then you read about something, you add it or you subtract it. And then the viewer, then you stand back and you watch the viewer look at the art, and then they see something and it may be totally different than what um, is there. So there's this magical quality around making art. You know, as you do it, it's almost like a uh, checkers. I played checkers for the first time the other day. I hadn't played and I go, oh, this is fascinating. I'm like trying to figure out if I do this, then that, and then something. So this is so much like painting. If I put this color here, and all that type of thing. Yeah, it's like this, this chain reaction. Yeah. When you go in the studio, there's always something. And it's like, like you start thinking of it one, one way, and it, it branches off into another direction. Yeah. And you, like, you see that in the evolution of these two, because there are so many different approaches. You know, the smaller pieces that are just the, like the en plein air style of painting. Yeah. And then just branching out to all these different that still feel cohesive, like they still feel like they work together. Well, that, that's good to hear because I have kind of like a, a shyness around all different styles, you know, so like it's a, almost a sign of the beginner that you're trying so many different things and you're working towards a cohesive body of work, so that's more mature, that type of thing. But for you to say there's a common, common theme, that gives me uh, relief, you know, to hear that. Yeah, because I think the, the conceptual underpinning there. Mm -hmm. So like that sort of guiding you through all of these. Right. And you, you mentioned too when we were, we were talking earlier about journaling. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I think that goes along with the discovery process in the studio too. Do you maybe speak to that a little bit? Yeah. How many times have I woken up in the middle of the night with an idea, with ideas? And then I I finally put paper and pencil next to my bedside stand because if I don't unload all those ideas onto some paper, then it just keeps going and going. I'll never fall asleep. Or first thing in the morning, you know, that type of thing. Um, coming up with ideas and just figuring things out. Right, yeah, because yeah, it's that chain reaction. Once you get the chain reaction going, it's like mm -hmm. this blood. You can't, you can't turn it off sometimes. Exactly. Um, but it's kind of funny is when sometimes when you read it, you don't know what you wrote. So there's an aspect. <laughs> Yeah, I can relate to that as well. I'm like, ah, 
it's brilliant, and I know exactly what's in it. And then you look back months later, and you're trying to, <laughs> trying to crack the code of it. Yeah. Um, so you, we've talked about a little bit about the influences of romanticism and 19th century art, and um, you know, some of the contemporary influences. Are there any other uh, inspirations of the moment, sorry, as you're looking at? Um, I have found uh, it was brought to my attention. She was brought to my attention. Her name is Hilma uh, Off Klimp. Hilma Off Klimp. And she's, you know, uh, I had talked to you about simultaneous inventions a little while ago. And she is somebody that I never heard of, and a lot of people have never heard of. And then they, she started to be heard of in the 1990s, but since uh, 2016, she's really hit. The stage. She was born in 18, I think 85, and she died in 1944. I remember when she died. And she uh, preceded uh, Mondrian and Kadinsky and those folks, uh, the founders, the fathers of abstract art. And yet, uh, a lot of art historians have found her work, and they're thinking that she invented it. She came up with these abstract ideas. She was so different and so radical uh, from what had been happening. Realism, you know, uh, representational art, that type of thing. So she knew she was different and she knew she was ahead of her time. And she said, when, as she died, she was, I don't want any of my work to be seen for 20 years until people can understand what's going on. So yeah. So if you Google her name, <laughs> Hilda uh, Off A F Clint, Clint A L I N T. It's just there's a couple YouTube's just fascinating. And so, so fitting in with me personally, talk about me for a minute. Um, starting out with representation, plein air, figurative painting. I love doing figurative work. Uh, portraits, love portraits because facial expressions. But then. To do that, and then, oh yeah, there's a repetitiveness, and then, then abstraction fits in. You know, like, what's different? How can I make this uh, emotion, uh, how can I put this emotion to paper? Or how can I put something massive, an idea like the sublime, onto paper? Well, you can paint, like Alice uh, Gornick, she's an artist. Uh, she's married to Eric Fisher, and she does incredible clouds, clouds, and beautiful uh, contemporary landscapes like that. So you, okay, you put this on and you just kind of, oh, I'm going to paint the tornado that's coming into Savannah today. But then, all right, and, and then you do the oomph one, the second, you know, I'm just like, oh, big. And then it's the idea, idea of the sublime. You know, how do you wrap your head around, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break the surprise, how do you have, wrap your head around the COVID? How many people have died from COVID? And so, okay, yeah, fifteen thousand. Whoa, that's amazing. You know, I don't, I don't even know that many people. You know, and then boom, and then the numbers keep going, and then it's two hundred thousand. It's just, and then it just takes off, and then the numbers don't mean anything. And then, then you think about each person who dies and how that affects that life. That life affects so many others. The ripple effect. So it's not just that depth. And so, do you want to talk about that piece now? Or do you want to... Sure. Yeah, yeah, just to, yeah. I mean, I think that speaks to your point, just to sort of wrap up this segment of it, that yeah. the, the, like, the sublime really does apply to the moment, and that it can be, like, that his, history isn't this static thing, that, like, with the example of the artist that you just gave, that, you know, you look back and unearth these things, the cycles that are repeating themselves. Yeah. Like Leotard. He's a uh, philosopher from the classical times, and he talked about the sublime in literature. So he was teaching people rhetoric and how to talk about uh, the, the, power, the power of the word, that type of thing. And so at that time, um, Greeks and Romans, they were looking at gods, goddesses, as the sublime. So people were looking at gods, and then, of course, then one god, you know, so then the sublime around one god, and then the sublime switch to God in nature, you know, uh, like Hudson River Valley artists, you know, the, the paintings of light showing the sun 
mountains, the, um, the uh, creations of God, how magnificent that is. And so then we look now at the sublime of now and we're looking at the effects of humans. So each one of those three things, COVID, why did it get so big? Humans messed up. We didn't jump on it right away. Political chaos. There are problems in our society we've never addressed, you know, between races in particular, you know? Climate change. I've been hearing about global warming since I was in college decades ago. I mean, decades ago, I heard about, I didn't even know what ecology was. I took an ecology class. And that teacher said, if we don't clean up our act in 40 years, we won't be able to do it. And that was, more, that was a long time ago. So that these events, we're not addressing them. It's humans not addressing them and actually activating the um, hurting ourselves. The sublime of them. And we have this really special opportunity to sort of perform this piece that you've done in response to COVID-19. Can we speak about the process of this piece? Yeah. Um, as I said, the idea for this piece came with my own inability to understand what half a million people dying of COVID looks like. Well, the number is, is just, I, I can't understand it and I can't wrap my head around it. So how, how do you represent that? How do you represent, represent something that it can't be seen, it can't be comprehended? So this is my answer to that question or problem. Each dot is a life, a person who died from COVID. And it started uh, February of 2020. And this role, if you count all the, um, here we go, all the um, squares, the 375,000 squares. And yet 560 people to, or about that right now have died. So I thought I'd be able to get everybody on one roll, but now I've had to start working on two rolls. This is a grid pattern. It's organized. It helps me to calculate how many people there are. There's a, a personal component uh, to this art piece because as I'm doing, as I'm putting each dot down with a Sharpie, I sometimes I think about the people. And just like people are individual, every dot in the square is individual. There's some people who are really centered in their lives, and other people are kind of off kilter. So it just it speaks of the people. Everybody's different. And then the ripples. Each person affects, you know, families like this family going by. You know, if somebody in their family dies, and another 20, 40, Hundreds of people, big families, are affected. So it's just astronomical, logarithmic numbers. And it's just, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. So, and I'm seeing too, now that it's unrolling, I mean, talk about overwhelming, first of all. Like, even a small section of this is overwhelming to look at when you think about the fact that each one is a person. But then the fact that they're each sort of sitting in their own little section of the grid is reminiscent of the social distancing. Um, you know, this containment of each dot, and some of them, as you said, are coming closer to the edges. They're not all perfectly centered, but there's this, this spacing out of them. Yep. And then, like, the mark of the dot as well, as almost like the most basic form, the most minimal form of writing. Like, it's the most minimal form that you could make to express something, but this says so much. Like, the individuality of each of these. Yep. And then where do you put a, a piece of work like this? Do you put it on a wall? Um, there's an intention to put it on the floor, on the ground, because when you look at a deceased person, they're in the grave, or, or they're, you know, the, the grave has just been dug and you're looking down into the grave, or you go to the cemetery and you pay your respects. Yeah, this, the physical action of looking down, or even like we're doing now, almost kneeling down to the ground Yes. to interact with this. And every single one. And then sometimes I misfired a nap too. And then one time I was so tired I fell asleep. And then there's a place where there's two 
huge dots, which brings another human element into it. Yeah, there are, there's more than one history in this. There's like the history of the record mm -hmm. that you're working from, and then the personal history that it took to create it. There's a reverence as as the roll is t unrolled and people revere it, and there's, it's almost a ritual aspect. It touches upon a lot of our theories, you know, like um, Freed's um, theatrics of the art piece, whereas he was opposed to the viewer being within the art piece. And then we just crashed his idea because we've included the viewer in part of our performance piece. And um, as people walk by and we share that this is a COVID piece and each one of these dots is a person, then you could just see them almost melt and then the memories of people they know who have passed came through and that's that ripple effect I was talking about. And so to have art that touches people, you know, is it's the idea, the touch, the aura of the art. That's that's it. That's it right there. So representative? Wow, it really looks like it. Bing bang wow, great. But then there's the idea, and that is contemporary art. It's the idea, the concept that touches people, and people connect with art. They love art. And I think they were struck, too, by the fact that you, know, you hand, hand made all of those dots. Right. That's the, one of the most powerful things that resonated with them, too, just like the time and the, and the focus and meditation that it takes to create this, right. to make it physical. Right. So I think that's really powerful. And I'm, I'm really glad that we were able to do this <laughs> Yes, um, so in a very you, special park. Yes, yeah, Forsyth Park here in Savannah. Which right is eerie the because there was an epidemic that this was a burial ground for the yellow fever, which is kind of, wow. Yeah, I get these things cycling back. And then to lay it on the ground. And then to pick up the texture and then the soil and the leaves that are flowing across it. And now it's all rolled up, like literally rolled up in it. Yeah. Yes, yeah. death shroud. Yeah. Pretty powerful. Pretty powerful. Thank you so much. For Thank you, Sam. Thank seeing. you for this huge opportunity. I appreciate you your work. Um, if you're watching, Neo Sublime is on view at the Sensi Green until April 27th, and you can view and purchase the work as well on our website, which is sulfurstudios.org. Uh, if you have any other questions, you can also reach out to us via info at sulfurstudios.org. Uh, my name is Sam, and this is Kathy Barati, and on behalf of Sulfur Studios, I wish you all a great day. Thank you. Thank you for watching this episode of Sulfur Artist Talks. Sulfur Studios is a project of Arts Southeast, a nonprofit whose mission is to make Savannah a destination for art and culture in the Southeast by supporting established and emerging artists, engaging a diverse community with creative programming, and developing awareness and appreciation of the arts. This content is made possible by viewers like you. If you'd like to support our mission, please visit us at www.sulfurstudios.org to learn more. You can also reach out to us via email at info at sulfurstudios.org. On behalf of Sulphur Studios, I wish you well and hope to see you next time. Thank you.